many years. In fact, his first job was in Books and Company, where we put him to work in the basement, which was just mountains and mountains of books. And every once in a while, he'd come up for air, and there was I, who was called everyone Mr. Merrill and Mr. Paz, and John would go up and say, oh, hi, Jimmy, hi, Octavio. And I said, how does he know all these people? And it turned out he was William Merwin's stepson. So he knew all the writers and the poets, and he wrote his first book while he was at Books and Company called Bicycle Days. So we were happy to celebrate that. And when I learned the subject of his book was Svetlana Stalin, I decided to explore the Russian collection at the New York Society Library. And I wasn't surprised to learn we have a lot of fiction in translation, including our most popular author, Tolstoy, with 175 books, followed by Turgenev with 120 books. And our Russian books went out 70 times last year. I'd like to thank Harriet Shapiro, Mia Devanzo, and Stephen McEarl for their great detective work for me. The Red Daughter tells the story of Svetlana Stalin's defection to the United States. John's father, Alan Schwartz, was a lawyer who escorted her here to the United States under cover of the CIA. There have been amazing raves about this book. Kirkus gave it a star review. An insightful and compelling saga of a woman desperately trying to escape her famous past. P.W. called it a gripping historical novel, and I would have to agree with that. Jennifer Egan had this to say, I was surprised and engaged from the first paragraph of The Red Daughter. John is a novelist and screenwriter whose complicated and compelling characters have captivated countless readers. A master of historical and literary fiction, his acclaimed novels transport audiences through mesmerizingly detailed stories. From a newcomer's adventures in Tokyo, to, in bicycle days, to a tragic Ivy League romance in Claire Marble. A New York Times notable book of the year, Reservation Road was adapted into a 2007 major motion picture written by Schwartz and starring Joel King Phoenix, Mark Ruffalo, and Jennifer Connelly. His book, The Commoner, was inspired by the life of the former crown princess, now empress of Japan. I've been thinking of this mesmerizing book as I read about the abdication of the emperor, Akita, and the enthronement ceremony of Naruhito, his son. I recommend this book for all who wish a wider understanding of Japanese culture and the current monarchy, or just would like a wonderful read. And if I still had a bookstore, I would have had a big stack of it right by the cash register. <laughs> Schwartz's work has been translated into more than 20 languages around the world. He is the recipient of the 1991 Lindhurst Prize for Mastery in the Art of Fiction. And his journalism has appeared widely in publications such as The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The Boston Globe, and Vogue, and numerous essays of his have been widely anthologized. Since writing the script for Reservation Road, Schwartz has become an accomplished writer for film and television, as well as a novelist. In 2018, he was nominated for a Writer Guild of America Award for Outstanding Writing. This taught fiction at Harvard, Sarah Lawrence, the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. And he is a longtime literary director of the Sun Valley Writers Conference, one of the leading literary festivals in the United States. He lives in Brooklyn, New York, and Salisbury, Connecticut, with his wife, screenwriter and food writer Alexandra Propanzano, and their son Garrett. And now, let us welcome John Schwartz. <laughs> Company, for any of you who don't remember, was one of the great bookstores in the United States. And it was my first job out of college. I was indeed in the basement <laughs> with a guy named Todd Colby, who used to lis listen to Captain Beefheart 
all day long at incredibly loud decibels. And I do remember one day when I, I came in and there were guys in hazmat suits down there trying to suck out all the uh, various things from the walls. But, uh, and I also remember it, it, it was, I'd been working there about three months and it was suddenly holiday time. And I got uh, bumped up out of obviously desperate need by the staff upstairs to the, the front desk. <clears throat> and uh, it turned out that I didn't really know how to rap, which on the Upper East Side was a serious problem. So that was extremely patient. Uh, but it was a great store, and I, I really did get a great education there. Uh, you know, we didn't have computers at the time. When you sold out of a book, you wrote down the title on a little index card by the cash register, and we were all responsible for tracking our various subjects and favorite authors and so you, the list would just keep building and uh, we got you know paid partly in books and it was a wonderful way to start my writing career and, my, and continue my reading. So I'm, I'm still grateful and she and Alex are just wonderful people. So thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to, and I just want to say one thing about Society Library. I grew up on the Upper East Side, and my mother, who eventually moved to Hawaii and for the rest of the last 40 years of her life, was a member here, and a few times I came with her, and this was one of her sacred spaces, a place she really loved, and one of the places that I think it was hardest for her to leave when she moved uh, 6,000 miles away. So I've always, uh, aside from just the beauty of the place and the books, I've always had um, a particularly soft spot for, for this building and, and these rooms. So I'm very glad to be here as well. Uh, the Red Daughter is indeed a novel. There, these reserved seats are not really reserved. Uh, our son actually had to do his homework instead, and, and his grandparents had to stay with him to make sure he was <laughs> So that's why those three seats are empty folks. Uh, it's true. Um, it is a novel, but I want to begin with two stories uh, about one woman, one that takes place in the middle of her life, and the other one that takes place around the time of her death, 45 years apart. Of course, the woman is not any woman. She, it was Svetlana Lulueva, who was the daughter of Joseph Stalin. So 1967, April, Stalin's daughter, 14 years after his death, on a particular spontaneous journey that I will take you to again toward the end of the talk, defects to the West. And she defects in, in India, but she ends up in Switzerland, and there she waits to see if she will be taken in by the states. She was and remains the most significant Soviet citizen by far ever to defect to the West. I, th I would say Nuriyev was a somewhat distant second, depending on your view. And to give you some little window into the insanity that occurred when she did defect, on the day that she arrived at JFK airport, uh, setting putting her first footsteps in America. There were more press and more people there waiting for her than there had been for the Beatles three years earlier. Wow. Four days later, she gave a press conference at the Plaza Hotel. Uh, there were press from 115 different countries. Her memoir sold around the same time. Uh, World Rights went for a million and a half dollars back then. It was second in in its amount only to Churchill's memoirs at that time in history, and the book went on and became an enormous international bestseller. So she was extremely famous at that time, having already grown up and being the most famous woman in the Soviet Union, to two-edged sword, even before social media. And she was, by any standard of the time, for, especially for a communist, uh, rich. Uh, those things would not stay with her forever, and they would not last, but that is that moment in time when she arrived. Now I want to jump ahead 45 years, uh, a less 
celebrated atmosphere. Uh, it's my house in Brooklyn, 2011 in the morning. I go down, get the paper, actual paper, and there on the front page, in huge headline, it says, Lana Peters, Stalin's daughter, dead at 85. Now, Lana Peters was the third name that she would have over the course of her 85 years. She was born Svetlana Stalina. She had that name until uh, after her father died in 1953. Then she took her mother's maiden name, Alleluia, and then after she came to the States, she'd been here for a few years for reasons that if you really want to know, you'll have to read the novel. She ended up becoming Lana Peters and ultimately an American citizen, at least for a while. So Svetlana, uh, Stalin's daughter, Lana Peters, Stalin's daughter, dead at 85. And I see the headline, and I wasn't even sure that she was still alive. So I was surprised and sort of vaguely curious. And then I began reading. I hadn't thought about her in many, many years. And right away in the beginning of this huge obituary, the writer tells me that her life was so extraordinary that it reads almost like a Russian novel. So I am intrigued. And there on the front page, there's one photograph, not of her as a woman, but as a girl. There is Stalin, you'll see this picture in a minute. Stalin at the age, probably in the mid-30s, so he's maybe 59, 60, looking very youthful, strong. He's in a kind of his typical military peasant uh, tunic. And in his arms is an eight or nine-year-old girl with coloring much like his. And they're looking at each other. It looks almost like he's about to kiss her, and she's smiling. And the word that comes to mind, at least came to my mind, was tender. It seemed like an image of tenderness, and an image that didn't lie. So I continued to read about this life, and I turned the page inside the paper. And there is another photograph. And this time, she's in the middle of her life. And I am stopped cold, because I recognize the photograph, and I will show it to you here. I recognize the woman in it, not just from history, but I actually recognize her. And I recognize the man because it's my father, who was then 34 years old. This is at JFK on that very day, uh, the old microphones from the late 60s. And that picture had hung in our house um, on the wall for numerous years. Uh, she had come actually that same summer and stayed with us for almost a month uh, at our summer house where we were renting on Nantucket and she would come and stay with us numerous times after that over the next eight to ten years during which time my father was her lawyer, friend, and closest advisor. Now, how was it that my father came to stand there. Well, as, as Jeanette said, he was, he was the young lawyer who went over in the middle of the night under CIA cover. It turned out that when she defected, she had a memoir, unpublished memoir, of a manuscript with her. And it was something she'd written in 1963 called 20 Letters to a Friend. And that was the book that got that enormous contract. A copy of that memoir, as she appealed when she defected to the United States, was sent to George Kennan, who lived in Princeton, New Jersey, the great Russia diplomat and scholar, in fact, whose very essay about containment theory, many of us read in college, uh, I believe I, I did, and in some ways you could say was sort of the father of the Cold War. And his neighbor in Princeton and friend was the senior partner at my father's law firm. And so, the publishing, Kennan read the book, recognized its significance and its quality, and immediately believed that it should get a publishing contract and that that would be the currency under which she would be allowed in to the country. And so that's how that project came to my father's firm and to him. And then in the end, of course, none of the old guys wanted to travel to Switzerland in the middle of the night under CAA cover, <laughs> and so they sent the other guy. Now, when he went over, he had a false passport, and he was met in Basel by a Swiss intelligence 
agent. Svetlana had been in Switzerland now for some weeks waiting to see whether or not the United States would in fact take her. And she was under high security because there was serious concern that she would be assassinated on Swiss soil by the Soviets. And my father was met by this Swiss intelligence man. He puts him on a train to Zurich. He gets to Zurich in the middle of the night. He's put into a hotel. They don't have motels in Switzerland. Sometimes. And he's the only person there. Think of the shining, but with Swiss hotels. <laughs> he spends four hours that night, sleepless at night. He gets dressed again. He goes to the airport in the morning. And there in a back room under a guard is Stalin's daughter. And they meet, and under a married, the names of a married couple, two false passports, Mr. and Mrs. Steli, very tricky, <laughs> they are put uh, on the plane. Nobody knows who they are or who she is. They go to first class. It's the old days, not like book tour now. <laughs> my father immediately orders two martinis for both of them. Not going to be the last. It's the morning. And they take off. Halfway through the flight, my father is um, summoned by the Swiss pilot who's enraged. He's just discovered over the radio who he's flying. He's alarmed. He's angry. Uh, he lectures my father, but at the end he says, well, now the word is out. Everyone knows. So they go back, and it is in the hours from that moment on until they land at JFK that all those people amass at the airport. During the rest of the flight, probably under the uh, effects of more martinis, Svetlana turns to my father and tells him that he reminds her of her beloved brother, Yakov. And Yakov died during the war. We'll hear a little more about him in a moment. And this was either an auspicious or ominous sign, depending on how you chose to look at it. But in fact, it is safe to say that during that flight, and given that she had left every single person in her life behind, including two nearly adult children. Uh, it's safe to say that my father was indeed the closest person to her as she entered her new life, and would remain so till the mid-70s, after which he no longer represented her. She was, as you will also see, a very challenging client, but she would continue to write to him for the rest of her life every so often. And when I began this project, my father opened up his 40-year file to me very generously. And there were all these letters and many other documents, uh, some of which we'll, we'll get to. So I saw the obituary, and I saw the photo. And the next morning, I began work on the Red Daughter. And about that, I'll say two things that Sort of like during the uh, Clinton campaign, not to date myself, you know, he's on the wall, it was, it's the economy, stupid. I had my own two <laughs> versions. One was a fact about Svetlana, uh, which is not a novel, it's just a fact, which is that she was the daughter of a man responsible for the death of more than 20 million of his own people. It's a fact we sort of all know, but you still have to chew on it for a while when you're thinking about the daughter. The second thing that was on my wall all the years was more of a description, which still is not a novel. It's just a description, which is to say, and it's true, I believe, which is to say that she, spent, she would spend her entire life searching for a home and searching for a self of her own that felt genuine or even real. And that she would spend her whole life also trying to show the world and herself that she was not her father's daughter. She would never succeed. And she would never stop trying. And I suppose it was somewhere along going from the, the constant failure and uncertainty and the mistakes to the persistence and the desperate need to try and understand what love was even, and what a home was, that I came to have a certain degree of wonder about her and her life. Wonder not just in, in, in terms of curiosity, but wonder almost in terms of awe at that, what that journey was. 
And so then you have a fact and you have a description, which still, as I said, is not a novel. For a novel, you need to get inside, because of course that's what novels do better than any other art form. They deal with the interior of our lives and of our experiences. You have to get in in order to show how, what, how the outside became how it was and how the life experience manifested itself for the people involved. So how was I going to get inside this person and that fact and that description? And thinking about it for a while, reading everything I could get my hands on about her life, including the three memoirs she wrote. The first one was good, um, and we'll mention that again, but the second two, not so good. The second one, all right, and the third one, never published. And, but still revealing, and then three dozen other books of different kinds and the letters. So there were two ways that I thought I might be able to get inside in order to begin this project, and one was her voice. Uh, Svetlana spent the first half of her life only in Russian, though she learned English, and it was decent English, not great, but decent, strong Russian accent. And she spent the second half of her life mostly in English, speaking and writing. And when I looked at these letters over the decades, my father, she sent to my father, very emotional, sometimes very warm, she was Russian, but also filled as the years went by with complaints, resentments, senses of conspiracy forming around her, um, exaggerated elements perhaps of victimization. I could see a voice that was going bit by bit from being an open hand in the earliest part of her life to a fist and then gradually a fist that kept clenching and clenching and clenching. You could see it in the, in the words themselves. Certain words every so often on a page capitalize, exclamation marks, underlining three or four times. And I just came to feel that this voice was not commensurate in its expressiveness, and this is the arrogance of a novelist, of course, but was not commensurate with the life she had lived because the life was purely an emotional life. And though I'm going to really give you the first half of her life here, which is really only about the first third of the novel, because I really want you to read the novel, and I also think you will be surprised and in some places shocked by what she goes on to do and the choices she makes. But they were the only way to understand those choices is to understand her emotional engine, if you will, understand what it felt like inside, because there's no other way to, to explain how she directs herself and redirects herself into different pockets of history, almost always against good sense. She was not shrewd, she was intelligent, but she was not canny, she had no agenda, she was not political, though she inhabited a political life in ways more than most people would ever dream of. She didn't want money, particularly. She didn't really even understand it very much. She was haunted and driven. And so, even when I read the, this very good biography published of her five years ago, Stalin's Daughter, it's very good, very straightforward, but in the end, I still felt sorry for the biographer for being yoked to that voice, and only that voice. So I thought I need to find a voice that's related but different, that maybe has a few more registers if I can, and that ultimately is by being less extremely emotional, maybe is more resonant in certain ways, if I can. That's one. The second point of access to the inside is this photograph. And of course, I, have, I had realized I had this connection to it, but also the idea of somebody who goes over and brings her in, a stranger himself, a little bit younger, um, who carries her but is not Virgil, does not have that sort of self-possession, uh, has his own 
concerns, his own feelings ultimately. And I took the idea of that role and um, I used many of the specific details in the early part and then I extrapolated it so that that relationship would extend over, over the rest of her life and his. And I gave it a much more intimate cast because I wanted to create a window in which we might have sympathy for her, for this difficult character, and in which, in the telling, she might have more sympathy for herself. And so, if you open the book, you'll find that it begins with an editor's foreword. And this is written by a man named Peter Horvath, who's now in his 80s, widowed, retired, and alone. And he is that figure, but many years later, he was her lawyer, he tells how he brought her in, and then he tells how years later, after learning about her death in the newspaper, a few weeks after that, foxes arrived at his door, he didn't know what they were, he opens it and there are 28 school notebooks in which she has written in Russian by hand over all these years, the, the journal from the first day of her arrival in America until the end of her life. Now these are fictional, Journals, I know because I wrote them. <laughs> and so Peter Horvath and the editor's foreword is presenting what you were about to read, which are these journals. And he is the editor, though as he tells us toward the end of that note, he was not really her editor, he was something else. And he lets us know that he is still himself trying to understand who she really was and what she was and what they were together. And then we begin, and it is three in the morning, the very night after she has arrived, and she goes back to try and say for herself how she came to be where she is, which means to tell the first part of her life leading up to this. And there will be editor's notes strewn throughout the chapter, and throughout the book in little chapters in which Peter also helps her tell this story and in some way also gives us a backdoor autobiography of his own because he is emotionally intimate with the story and with her. So that's the structure of the book and now I'm going to take you back the way she does in the very beginning and then I'm going to lead you back at this place because as I said I think Without understanding that, you can't understand what she's going to do afterwards, which really still I find incredibly surprising and where it leads her. <coughs> You'll recognize the man on the left. The woman on the right was uh, Nadezhda Alaryeva, Nadia, uh, Svetlana's mother, who um, met Stalin uh, during the revolution and worked for him as his secretary. She was 23 years younger, by all accounts, ultimately a more devout communist than he was. A woman without any notable maternal instinct. A very, very driven for the party and always attempting to educate herself further in the party. Svetlana was raised entirely by her nurse, Alexandra Andreevna, who was one of the most important people in her life. She could never remember being held or touched by her mother. And when Svetlana died in 2011 in a retired uh, assisted living home outside of Spring Green, Wisconsin, it's a long journey, on a shelf in this one room flat, she was wearing secondhand clothes. Nobody knew who she was anywhere around her. She was very feisty with everyone. There, was, there were three or four things that she had, that she had kept her entire life, tokens from her childhood. One was a picture of her nurse. The other one was a picture of her mother holding Svetlana as a baby, which she kept as proof that her mother had loved her, though she could not herself remember ever being held by her. And the one true memory she had of her mother was her mother drawing a square over her heart when she was very young girl and saying, pointing into it and saying, that is where you must bury your secrets. And then when she's six and a half, one morning she wakes up, she's woken up by her nurse and taken, dressed in special clothes and taken into 
into uh, the Kremlin, to the Red, Red Square, and into a public building where there are people milling about, and there's a coffin, and there's her mother inside. Her mother has died overnight. And it will be 10 years before she comes to understand by picking up a British magazine and, and reading it one day when she's 16, that her mother did not die of a ruptured appendix as she thought and everyone in the nation thought, because Pravda never even mentioned the cause of death, but that in fact, after being publicly humiliated by Stalin at a state dinner, she'd gone into her room and shot herself. So she never saw her mother again after that, and now there's the nurse, and now there's one parent, and the parent is Stalin. And this comes, this is the photograph that I mentioned from the front page of the paper that day in the obituary. And this is that tenderness I mentioned. And by all accounts, she was the one person who could soften his heart during these years. And if you read the letters that passed between them, and there were, there were many, because he was often absent. He would spend the whole fall uh, in, in Sochi. He, would, he built a, a dacha for himself uh, outside of Moscow, 15 miles out, called Kuntsieva, which is still there, where he lived. They would see each other, but he had his own world, but these letters are incredibly tender. And he called her his housekeeper, his little secretary, and he would ask her to give him orders that he would then be able to fulfill, sending her things, uh, sending her notes. She was often, as you'll see, um, in the midst of his life. Uh, that's Vasily, her brother, five, year old, five, five years older on the left. Uh, he was an alcoholic by 13, and he was a colonel in the Red Air Force at 20, still an alcoholic. And in his 30s, he was in prison after Stalin had died, and then he was dead by 41. And that on the right is Yakov, uh, her half-brother, 19 years older. Vasily scared her, and Yakov protected her. And, but during these years, she was the one. She would appear in pictures everywhere where she'd be sitting on the lap of Lavrenci Beria, you know, one of the many, maybe the worst snake of all among Stalin's underlings, Malenkov and Bukhanin, and you would see her sort of popping up, the one girl, the one female figure in this very male world. And the letters, I actually use a couple of the actual letters in the book because there's something about their intimacy and innocent, that to me, given what one comes to know about the arc of her life and her emotional life, that those letters and those exchanges between them, he would say, my, housekeep you know, my housekeeper, and she would say, dear Papushka, and they almost had radioactive properties, as I saw it, as they resonated through the book, but also through her life, forward and back. The thing is, though, the terrible paradox was that during these years of the 30s, into the, into the beginning of the war, when she and he did have this tenderness, this tenderness, you might say it's not love, but in any event, it's the one thing she knew that love might be. And it's all she had to go on. And so the problem is, is that these were the same years when Stalin was becoming Stalin. He was in his full power. These were 1932, 33, the Great Famine. Five million people starved to death. The Great Purge, when every potential enemy was removed from any possible institution in the country. The Great Terror, you know, 37 to 38 alone, 700,000 people were shot. 17, 1.7 million were, th were arrested and by 1938, two million people were in the Gulag. So this is the Stalin. And then at home, that's Yakov. Stalin had bullied him mercilessly during the years, the point where he tried to kill himself. He missed his heart when he shot himself, allowing Stalin to remark that he couldn't even shoot like a man. And then when the war began, he immediately volunteered to go to the, be sent to the front with his unit. They were sent to the front that day and he was captured immediately by the Nazis and put in a concentration camp. And she would never see him again. So, though she did not know 
what her father was doing during these years, even though her own family began to disappear. Members of particularly her mother's family, but even some of Stalin's family. In the end, when she, when she did find out Khrushchev's secret speech in 56, which was the beginning of the, uh, of the release of some of, some, only some of the facts, but they were bad enough. And then ever after, the more she learned and the more she was told, especially when she came to America, she had to put these two things that were inextricable from each other, somehow try and see them separately or make some sense out of them. Because again, this was the only person who had ever shown her, the only parent who had ever shown her any tenderness. But things get more complicated. She's 16, it's 1942, and it's the 10 year anniversary of her mother's death, and nobody seems to care. Her father's never mentioned her mother's name again. She's not allowed to discuss it with anyone. And she's just recently learned what happened to her mother, in, 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 in fact. And she's at a party thrown by her brother, and she meets this. Uh, older Jewish filmmaker, very well known. This is it's actually about 12 years before this picture. It's Alexei Kepler, and they begin an affair. She falls madly in love with him, and over the next months, few months, they take a very great risk and begin to see each other. It's not even sure, certain how physical it became, but at the end of the winter, she wakes up in the apartment where she lives with her nurse in the Kremlin, and getting ready for school, and suddenly there's Stalin. He's never there in the morning. And he's enraged, and surrounding him are all the letters and photographs from Kapler that, she, that he's been sending her. Well, of course he knew. And he's ripped them to shreds, and he slaps her across the face and calls her a whore, and he sends Kapler to the gulag, where he'll be for the next 11 years until Stalin has died. But from that moment on, there is no more housekeeper. And that whole little bubble that has been able to exist above or under the other Stalin uh, disappears. And though she will see her father again, she's never in that circle again. And she can't quite know how to deal with that. You can see her wandering and wondering about it in what happens over the succeeding 10 or 15 years. In 1945, she marries a Jewish student where she's at university, she's quite young. Stalin is deeply against this for <clears throat> many reasons. And uh, she has birth, gives birth to a boy whom she names Joseph, though Stalin is not interested in the least. Five years later, after that marriage has ended, she marries the man that Stalin tells her to marry. That ends after a year or two, but she gives birth to a girl, Katya. In late 1953, Stalin dies. So we were talking, uh, Jeanette and Alex and I, about the movie uh, uh, The Death of Stalin, which I, I recommend very highly. I laughed the entire plane ride as I was watching it. But it deals with this death of Stalin and all the, the snakes and vipers under him who are then in terror and ambition, wondering what to do and what to make and how to survive of his death, which does indeed last three days. But the only person who's there all that time who stands out from the others is Svetlana. And she's there all those three days, filled with these wildly changing emotions of remorse to sadness, grief, regret, um, anger. And then he's gone, and she is still the princess of the Kremlin, but now sort of floating, and she, as she will be for some years. In 1956, of course, uh, Khrushchev gives his secret speech. Stalin is denounced, and his crimes supposedly are revealed, though, of course, it's just scratching the surface. And also, her nurse dies. And now she begins to try and withdraw and become anonymous, something that she will try to do many times, but of course it's impossible. The best-selling perfume in the Soviet Union is still called Breath of Svetlana. And then in 1962, to give a little window again into this 
this wandering, this, this yearning for love, for acceptance, for anonymity, whatever it is. In the middle of the night, she meets a, a Russian Orthodox priest in the cathedral outside of Moscow. He's risking his life by doing this. It's against the law. And there he baptizes her. And he tells her that God loves her even though she's the daughter of Joseph Stalin. She writes her memoir, 20 Letters to a Friend the Next Year. And it is, it, it's, it does reckon to some degree with what she has learned about her father as his crimes have begun to be revealed. But mostly it is about her childhood. It's about this almost idyllic home and atmosphere, family life that she felt she shared, her mother's people, even her father's relatives, how they would all be in this, the dacha Zubavolo when she was young, which uh, the landscape uh, soothed her so much. And so there's a romantic quality to it, and yet it's beautifully written and quite wise in other ways, very Russian. And then it's, we're in the 60s, and it's 66, she meets, she's in a hospital for some reason, she meets there an aging Indian communist, and they begin to talk. He's there, he's very ill, and he will be, always. And she finds him wise and calm, and when she gets out, and then eventually he gets out, she invites him to come and live with her and her children. On the right is Joseph at the age of 21 in 1967, and that's Katya, 16. Uh, the same year. So the Indian man, Raja Singh, dies after a few months. He was very sick. And she had not been allowed to marry him because he was Indian. And then she asked Ligachev, the head of the Communist Party, if she'll be allowed to fulfill her promise to him and take his ash ashes to India to give to his, his people. And they deny her, and then at a certain point, months later, suddenly uh, her passport is handed over to her. A government minder shows up, and she's supposed to go to the airport. She packs a bag. She's allowed to leave for two weeks, and she's never been out of the country. She says goodbye to her children. She expects to come back. They expect to see her back. She gets on a plane with the minder, and she flies to Delhi. The minder is left in Delhi, and she takes a train, Svetlana does, down 600 miles down the Ganges to Raja Singh's very large family in a tiny village where the name of Stalin means nothing. And she is nobody except someone whom their relative had loved. And she participates in the funeral services in the river, and then she stays and settles into this room there. And after a week, she writes the consulate, Soviet consul, and asks, tells them that she's not feeling well and asks for an extension. And they reluctantly grant it. They don't have a lot of choice. She's down there. And they don't want to make a scene. And then after a couple of weeks, she does it again. She writes another for another extension. She does this three times. And three times, it's reluctantly granted. Joseph writes a letter, he's confused, he doesn't understand, is she sick? No, she's not sick. But something has begun to happen to her. She's having a transform transformative experience of some kind. And it has to do with being in a place where she is finally nobody. And where she's looking back for the first time at the Soviet Union, at the place that she came from, where she was Stalin's daughter, always will be Stalin's daughter. And she sees the cage that she has felt all along, or she thinks she does. She sees herself in the cage, and she sees her children in the cage forever. And she comes to think in a way that she will come to regret and consider to be perhaps wrong over the years as she lives with the guilt of leaving her children. She comes to think that she is part of the problem, though she never felt complicit in her father's crimes. She felt like a victim herself. She nonetheless comes to see herself almost as a, a, a lever wielded by that and something that will keep her children imprisoned in that name and that cage. So her time is up. She can't, they won't let her stay anymore. She goes back 
to Delhi. She is, the next morning, the plane is set. There are going to be half a dozen people on the plane with her to make sure she goes home. And she's supposed to, there's supposed to be a dinner for her. At, she's in the guest house next to the consulate. She tells them she has a migraine. She packs a little bag. Not quite sure what she's doing. She walks out. She finds a phone. She calls a taxi cab. It comes. She gets in the taxi cab without being seen. It goes four blocks to the embassy, which is right next door, practically. She goes in. She knocks on the door. It opens, and she says who she is and what she is and what she wants. And of course, they don't believe her. In fact, they know almost nothing about Stalin's daughter at all. There are people there who aren't even clear that he had a daughter. Uh, that's the way it used to be before the internet. And they begin to interrogate her. They ask her to write out her story, which she does. They send in a psychiatrist to evaluate her mental state. I found this evaluation in my father's papers. There's a little bit of it in the book. It's it's pretty good, especially if you've had as much therapy as I have. <laughs> um, they send to the State Department the cable to ask what to do. Now, it is the height of the Cold War. It's the eve of the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. Uh, the, the nuclear knife edge that everyone perceives to be in existence, probably was, uh, is at its most intense, sharpest, and the State Department is not keen to hear this news. And while they're waiting many hours to hear from them, even though the clock is ticking for Svetlana because she'll be discovered in the morning, uh, the envoy there sympathizes with her, believes her, and he goes ahead and buys two tickets on a plane that's going to Rome. And he gets on the plane with her, and then it is delayed and it sits on the tarmac for three hours. And during that time, the cable comes back from the State Department saying that they will not take her. We will not take her. And if they'd known that the plane was still on the tarmac, they would have gone on and taken her off and put, brought her back to the Soviet consulate, but they did not. The plane takes off, goes to Rome, and from there it goes to Switzerland, and from there into the convent, and there she meets Mr. Stilling. And then we arrive back. This is the Plaza press conference four days later. And that's, my, that's Svetlana and my father. So I'm going to leave you there with all the rest ahead of her. And it, it will take her places it's hard to imagine. Um, and she will make some decisions that it's hard to accept. But I want to leave you with words she said when she arrived at JFK. My father had suggested she say a few things. He wanted to give her some words to say, and she refused. She wanted to speak her own mind, which was very typical. And one of the things she said was to the enormous group of reporters, which she said, I believe that one can feel at home anywhere where one can be free. And it's a nice statement. But I would say that you have to think about the arc of her life from beginning to end and understand and think about it again and go back and look at those words, home and free, and really wonder that by virtue of where and to whom she was born and how her life began and how it evolved, whether she ever felt free or could or whether she ever felt home at home or found a place to land. So I'm going to leave you there, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much. KGB, guys who ran the KGB, by the way, did not fare so well. You can imagine once she was allowed to defect. But uh, her children, let me put it this way. 
I would point to two things. In the 70s, um, a, n a number of times, word reached Svetlana and my father and the CIA liaison, a guy named Jamie Jameson, there's a character somewhat like him in the book, people who were really just trying to sort of keep an eye on her, since she was never any help to the CIA or the KGB, by the way, because she was just way too complicated. <laughs> and Joseph, it seemed, was reaching out to her, her son, through various intermediaries, an American journalist, supposedly, or someone else, so letters would arrive. And the advice from the CIA and the State Department to her was to do nothing not to respond. Kennan sometimes gave his impressions. The idea was that he might be acting on behalf of the KGB because Joseph and Katya had denounced her right after this press conference. They had written a letter. At this press conference, she said, my children have done nothing at all and I do not believe that they can be punished. And the next day, received a letter uh, from Joseph through various intermediaries that said, by your actions, we believe that you have, you know, broken off with us, and we ask that you leave us to leave our lives, lives, in, you know, independently of you. And that was it. Now, she never saw or spoke to Katya again. Uh, Joseph, she would see again. But during these times that he reached out to her, Either he was working for the KGB, so the State Department said, or he was not, in which case if she responded to them, they would be in danger, because it would seem like they might want to defect as well. So she never knew, and she chose not to act at that time. And she felt terrible guilt and began to think not only that everyone was conspiring against her, but that she had made a mistake. And this, again, is sort of the ex extreme emotions that she would have from one place to another. And so Katya ended up in, si in Siberia, Kuchatka, studying volcanic gases for the rest of her life. She was a scientist. Her husband killed himself. She had a daughter. And that was all that was ever seen of her. She died young. And Joseph um, had some medical issues. He was a cardiologist of some kind. He drank. And when she finally would see him again, it wouldn't go quite according to plan. By then, she had an American child. I will say that. So um, it's a complicated legacy. They're both gone. The American child is now in her 40s, a girl in real life, a woman. It's not a boy, it's in the book. Um, is alive. And all I can say is she lives in the Pacific Northwest. She did cooperate with biography, so I feel I have a good sense of the the emotional tenor of their relationship, which ultimately was, was very loving, if difficult. But the last picture I saw of her, uh, she was in the southwestern desert somewhere alone, striking a Patty Hearst pose with a half mohawk tats and pierced <laughs> and a little dress and carrying an AK-47. I don't really know what to make of that. So I'm just somebody else's book. So I, you know, anyway. Um, but last thing I'll say about the children, when Svetlana died of cancer in this hospital in Richmond Center, Wisconsin, uh, her daughter arrived a day late and got there and desperately tried to get in to see her mother, her body. And they, she was not allowed. That Svetlana had written, stipulated specifically that she not be allowed to see her body the way that she had seen her mother's body when she was six. Yeah. How has this experience brought you closer or not closer to your father? Um, I knew you were ask that. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it has brought us closer. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty close at this point anyway, but, you know, this book took a while. And in the beginning, first I think he was surprised, and then he opened his file to me, which was great. He had, you know, he had told stories about Svetlana himself. They were, you know, it was mostly that story of just going to get her. And then a couple of years in, um, I was trying to find out something about her wedding in America. 
And I found out to my surprise that not only had my father been there, because I couldn't find any descriptions of him, but that he had given away the bride. And he'd been the only representative for her, and he had gotten a, he didn't know she was getting married until he arrived, and three hours later, she married a man she'd known for two weeks. Now, where that happened, I'm not even going to tell you because it will blow your mind, but that's a whole different <laughs> section of the book. But uh, my dad, so years go by, and then I'm about to turn in the book. I finished the book, finished the draft, and he's about to retire. He's 86 now, and retired last year. In his office at home is that first picture I showed you. And so he got the book then, and I think, you know, he had, he was nervous about it. He was also a little ambivalent, I think, about this notion as he was about to retire from this quite extraordinary career he'd had, that of having someone else tell his story, or even though this character, Peter Horvath, is really not anything like my father, but you know, having a writer in the family. So we talked about that a bit, and then, uh, and then a couple of weeks later, I went home, he lives in LA, and I got a call from him, and he'd read the book, and he said really the nicest things. And I also, I should add, preemptively dedicated the book to him. <laughs> uh, he's a lawyer, and I'm no fool. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time on the author's note at the end. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge his help, his support, um, and, and all that. And also, I wanted to acknowledge uh, to a little bit his ambivalence. So, I, you know, as I said to him then, I looked forward very much to going around the country and talking about his role in this and this time, uh, historically, because I think it's quite extraordinary and it makes me happy to do so. And I just saw him and uh, he's very happy about it. It's nice. Yeah. Could have gone south. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with this exclusive access that you had to such a treasure trove of material, why did you decide to do this as fiction instead of nonfiction? So, uh, good question. As I said, there is a good biography of her that's quite full, and she had the daughters. You know, she, she, my dad's in the biography. She interviewed him. The things, little details, like Mr. and Mrs. Staling, the psychiatric report, other things, uh, I've never seen anywhere else. They themselves don't make a history, but first of all, I, I am a novelist. And so I tend to, I've written one other historical novel, as Jeanette said, The Commoner, about the Japanese imperial family. Try doing research on that. <laughs> and, you know, I try and do, I try and learn everything I can. I've read over three dozen books for this and uh, many other things. But then I'm, I am doing research as a novelist, which is to say I think ultimately I'm, I'm interested in the details after I, I deal with the sort of Hippocratic opening, which is first don't get it wrong, right? First do no harm. I don't want to get it wrong, so I want to know what I have to know to make a place and a time come to life. But beyond that, I'm interested in details that seem to me to have the most emotional and psychological resonance for the characters themselves. A lot of historical novels try and give you an entire period the political, the economic, the, the social, the cultural. This book is not like that. It has a lot of history in it, and it certainly covers quite faithfully the arc of her life. I mean, the role of Peter Horvath is certainly the most fictionalized aspect of it in that regard. But ultimately, it's an emotional portrait of her life because that is how she lived her life. That is how she saw the world and every decision she made, good or bad. And so that ultimately, I think, describes what my intentions are the most. When I see a detail that stands out to me, I see it as, if it's a good detail, I see it as an opening into a room. And I would say it's a room of truth rather than fact. And I want to go in there and I want to make then my own version of what that detail meant, but knowing what it actually, what connection it actually had, knowing it, it was connected. So that's the reason, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I'll come over what, here. What part so, yeah. of your narrative is fiction? Because most mm -hmm. of what you have just told us mm -hmm. is the narrative that I remember hearing mm -hmm. about her. There was just one thing that I had apparently got wrong, uh, and maybe this was something she was responsible for, 
um, which is that somewhere I heard uh, that, she, that she had had difficulty writing the manuscript after she got here, and that her editor had said, why don't you write this as though you were writing letters to a friend, and that was the origin of that title. But you give us So a no, she wrote it in story. Russia by, she wrote by it herself, Russia. yes. So the I, there was a Russian history. physicist who suggested that to her. Um, and you know, it was back in Russia before she ever thought of defecting. She wrote a second memoir the year after she was here called Only One Year. Yes. By then she, you know, I think it shows signs of the sort of celebrity and rushed quality, though it has, and she was also trying to come out more firmly against her father, but it's not nearly as good a book. Just to get back yeah. to the first part, uh, what part, uh, thank you for that, but what, what part of this uh, is, uh, how, I guess, I guess what I'm asking is, how does your method differ, and maybe it only differs a little bit, from someone who is writing history and who is trying to get inside mm -hmm. something? Well, I'll give you an example of a different, I mean, Hilary Mantel, you know, wrote Wolf mm -hmm. Hall, yes. Bring Up the Bodies, fantastic books. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, that's set in the many hundreds of years ago in England during King Henry VIII. And Hilary, Hilary Mantel has a, probably the most extreme philosophy of writing historical fiction of anyone I'm aware of. And basically she says it is wrong to make up anything that you, that, that you cannot prove, you know, happened. And so now she's writing entirely from long ago history, but she will not make up a scene that she can't prove happened. Obviously, she's making up dialogue, but she feels it's, it's wrong. Now, I would say that I think she, for her, it's wrong philosophically in a sense, and it, 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 it applies to that. I, I'm willing to make up certain things, but again, the details are almost all real. Uh, often, again, and to go back to what I said earlier, I, I really do, I see one leading to the other. I don't see a separation. Because once you're dealing with a character who you, you have already made up, I mean, it's your version. So you have to take everything you know about that person and try and view her with some sense of self that you didn't quite have. But all the details that actually she knew and touched and everything else uh, mean something. So you have to choose which ones mean something in the, in, the, in the state of the novel. But if you don't take any steps further than that, if you don't make up your own rooms and your own scenes, that character isn't going to live. Because that character never actually lived. You know, you're not writing that history. But I, I read that history. When I finished the biography, for example, which I read very, I devoured, it only convinced me more of what I wanted to do because I felt that there were places I couldn't get to at that point. So I'm, I prefer the scenes not to show. I think that if you knew what I know about her life, you would often think that things, certain details were real that maybe weren't, but that things that weren't, you think weren't real actually were because they were quite extraordinary and almost incredible. So that's just how I go about it. But yeah. Only one more uh, question. Yeah, I, I have, yeah, sorry, could, you have two more. And then, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, could you talk about the decision to let her in and whether it reached the presidential level? Uh, it certainly reached um, the secretary. Uh, yes, the president knew about it, but I don't think, I think accepted the decision, but didn't actively make the decision. Uh, if the secretary of state, uh, the head of the CIA, Attorney General, was a sort of focal point. Kennan was much listened to, ultimately, and I think probably swayed the group. And I, the publishing contract ultimately gave them the cover, in a way. They felt that that book, as a, as a document, would mean something. And, um, and then the Russians weighed in a couple of days later and called her a very sick person. <laughs> Jim, last question. Your, your spellbinding talk, uh, only interrupted by audible gasps in the room while you're going through. Um, it, when, you, when you referenced this photograph, you talked about how your father had written some words for Svetlana 
and she refused to take that. Not the first time. And I, going back to uh, my friend's, my dear uh, friend's question, in a sense, you took liberties that your father did not, if you will, mm -hmm. in terms of the relationship, giving voice, and that's how you open your talk about trying to find your voice. I'm curious, at what point along the eight and a half years did you finally give yourself permission or feel that you had found her voice? And if you might talk about your own journey, personal journey in the eight years and how you came through your own experience of the last eight years, through life experience, to better understand or to have a different sense of what on that Well, I, you know, her voice came to me quite quickly, actually, um, which is true about the commoner as well. I don't want to think about that too much from an analytical point of view, but it did. And I think that's the whole way in. You have to find your own voice for that. And then once you gradually find it and it sticks, then you're inside and, and you feel that the register has expanded. And you start to feel the, the weight of whatever she's carrying. Because now you know, you, you've read it, you know, you've read her words, you've read other people's words. For me, the structure, um, as it so often is, was the ultimate door that opened. And it took me about two years to find the structure in which Peter sets the frame. You know, and I needed, I didn't want the whole thing, and I didn't want to just hear from her, and I didn't think anybody could stand just hearing from her <laughs> and get, you know, get away with it. And I also, you know, ultimately, first, it took me a while to make him less passive, to make him more active, even for a person who wasn't exactly a super active, emotional type, because she was the most exciting thing that ever happened to her. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted that to capture something about that Cold War time also, which is a time that's now distant. So um, I tried to do that and to open that, and once I, I, I found the two of them, sort of going back and forth, and you know, you write a different character, and you write novels to go back to your, your question, I'm interested in a couple of different things, but one of the things seems to be people, women particularly, whose lives are taken from them. Their identities are taken from them. The Empress, when she married at 24 and crossed over, she lived a relatively regular life and entered this bizarre hermetic world for the rest of her life and disappeared. And Svetlana, who never even had that much time, she was born into this world to these people and she spent the rest of her life trying to understand what an identity was, in a sense. And so, I mean, I want to know what it's like to live any kind of life. But if you're going to choose that life to look into, you have to, you have to choose it. And so, every book is personal over time, as it becomes that way. I mean, she left her children. That's a very hard thing for anybody to accept, including the author. Uh, but ultimately, I understood it, and I felt really sorry for all. And, uh, and then she tried to be a mother at 45, and she did. She managed it, despite the AK-47. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel I don't need to write about myself to feel that somehow I'm, I'm constantly interacting with these people and learning from them and also giving to them. And that's what makes it interesting and, and, and gives the, the satisfaction aside from the language. So I think we have to stop. Yeah. <laughs>